All right. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for, for joining this session. And, and, and first of all, uh, thank you, Sedola, for inviting me. So it's my pleasure talking here. And let me share my screen. It's our pleasure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I hope um, you can hear it. Okay. I hope you can hear it. And yes. we can start. So welcome to this session, which is about the state of reactive streams. So this session is um, kind of full stack, uh, but just letting you know that I'm Java developer and most of the things that are gonna be covered here um, will be related to Java as well, because this session is more targeted for Java developers. But anyways, everything that we will be talking about is about the complete stack. So it's gonna be applicable for Java developers, for JavaScript developers, or any other kind of developers who is participant, participant, participating in this session today. So welcome. My name is Oleg Dukuka, and yes, I am from Ukraine, and I am talking right now from Kiev. And uh, yeah, just letting you know that bad things are happening in my country. So a part of supporting reactive programming, I'll appreciate your support to my country. Anyways, I work for VMware, I'm Java champion, I'm part of Project Reactor team. This is um, a reactive library, one of the most popular reactive libraries in the Java landscape. Uh, a part of that, I'm lead of our socket protocol. This is also reactive protocol. We'll be talking about this protocol slightly today. And a part of that, uh, I'm co-lead uh, and co-organizer of Java user group in Ukraine. And, uh, well, encouraging you to follow me. Here's a Twitter link. Okay, so we will be talking about reactive and the state of reactive programming and reactive streams. Today we will start with the story of reactive programming because it's really important to understand why reactive appears on the landscape at all. This is really important to understand what is the state and what is the future, of course. So then we will talk about the state and we'll, we will see whether reactive programming has any future or not. So this is our agenda for today. And the first thing that I'd like to, to say you is that reactive in general is about interaction. It's about how you interact with or how you react to all things that happens around you. And I'm not saying about particularly you, but everything that you're building today, which includes your applications, your services, and much more to that. So in general, the story of reactive programming or just reactive started really back, back in a time, like almost 40 years ago. And the first appearance of, of the reactive word happens in the in the context of of the system so the first it appears as a reactive system and if you look through this white paper you'll figure out that in this context reactive is about a type of system which reacts to all of the events that's basically what i told you at the very beginning so it continuously reacts to all everything that is happening over time without stops well, you may wonder, okay, what is what is then the difference between reactive system and, and just normal system that we are building every day? So, well, let's let's have a look at this bird called Goose. This is the main character of, of, of this story today. And let's just just think that, that the goose is the system that you are building. So non-reactive goose once it, it starts getting different, different events, different requests, like do this, do that, go here, here, do something else, move something over there. There is no enough food. You have to collect your, the food yourself. And if goose is non-reactive one, well, this goose will, will just ignore everything. It's, a, it's a just, just, just bird, well, which does, doesn't understand anything. Well, it's okay for birds to ignore everything sometimes. 
and care about food and, and producing, well, poops. Well, that's okay for birds as well. So at some point in time, once goose starts ignoring everything and will be just, just taking into account the presence of food and absence of food, it will figure out that the food disappears. Because, you know, goose ignored everything that was told to him. Like, we move food to a different place or you have to collect food yourself. So if goose does not react to everything, well, then goose is going to die at some point in time because goose will never know where take, where find a food, where find some food for survival. So in this particular example, any type of system which doesn't react to the environment changes, like the hard drive is broken, the hard drive is unavailable, the service is unavailable, the other microservices is down, everything which is which is being ignored may cause a failure for your system. And we all know those type of systems. When you see the cascading failures, where you see the, the service is crashing unexpectedly because the other dependency is unavailable because it's just starting up. So all this type of system can be considered non-reactive because they don't take into account the important changes of the envi environment. On the other hand, reactive system, as I say to you, is a system which continuously reacts to everything that happens around it. So if service is unavailable, here we go, I have a fallback. If another service is just starting up, well, I will wait a bit and will retry. If something else happened, okay, that's fine, I will figure out, and so forth, and so on. So basically, reactive system or the goose, which is going to be reacting to everything, will be trying to fit into new environment to survive. So this is the main goal of reactive system, to bring value for customers, to respond and to survive. Anyways, this is reactive system. And this is just one mentioning of the word reactive. And you may start wondering that we are talking about reactive streams. So what a heck here is happening? Well, the answer is reactive system is something which affects directly, as we're going to see through the session, reactive programming and reactive streams. And reactive system is going to be kind of a target for reactive programming and for reactive streams of today. Anyways, the story of reactive programming started, well, around the same time. And it started when those two guys started their competition for, for the market of, of computers for everyone. And it, around this period of time, they started building their, their UI, UI system, UI applications. And the developers which were building their, their applications, their, their systems for, I don't know, terminal, for just, 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 black boxes, um, they were building just, just something related to science and to math, started building something related to UI. So this is a completely different area, the area of graphic applications, where the input which is given is not the data set, but something that user does with their um, keyboards, mouses, anything that is that could be built in into, into the, the, the hard computer or hardware. So the problem of this period of time that engineers were trying to solve was the problem of how to build a UI which is a responsive UI. Well, imagine or just put yourself onto, onto, onto this place of engineers which were building just something related to Moz, and, and right now they started building something related to graphic interfaces. Well, probably you will be using as, as, as such engineer just simple imperative programming, structured programming, etc., etc. So one of those engineers tried to build an application which allows you to, to just, just move boxes over your screen. 
and that engineer ended up with something like this. Which is just dramatically lagging. Like my very first computer when I just started it. Well, you may wonder what's happening? How we ended up with, with such slow user interface? With such slow item dragging? Well, if we're gonna look at the source code, we'll see just imperative programming. Just some procedures for mouse, for intercepting mouse up, mouse down events, mouse move events. And then of course those events uh, are, are uh, treated properly, but if we're gonna look how those procedures are, are used, we will see that they are used just in a simple while loop. Well, because again, the engineer which was doing that was the engineer which was doing procedural and, and structured programming all the time before. So nothing new was there yet. And the engineer was trying to build best to their knowledge. So the engineer just used sleep, well, sleep to, to give some time for other processes to, to apply their actions. Well, at this point in time, we had just a hardware with a single CPU, with a single core. So everything related to multi-threading wasn't real. It was just emulation. So the engineers was required to give some time for other programs. That why, that's why sleeping was something common those days. But engineer decided to use one second. And uh, deliberately, one second wasn't enough to to draw like smooth movement of the objects on on the screen. Well, the engineer decided to decrease the pause time, so it put hundred of miles, and it started being slightly better, but it still was a bit laggish. Well, after all, engineer was trying to decrease, decrease, decrease the sleep and the engineer ended up that the best sleeping period of time is zero. So the box started moving really smooth, but after that everything else stopped at all. Of course we were able to move the box over screen, however everything else was completely frozen because the engineer's program was just, just occupying everything on your hardware. So that was a huge problem because engineers of that period of time wasn't, wasn't ready to build proper UI applications. The operation system UIs wasn't prepared their APIs and gave engineers something, something proper to, to, to use to build an application which draw something on the screen. So that was a huge problem. So people, started thinking, 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 and slightly later, in 1992, Microsoft, well, Microsoft posted a white paper where they introduced something beautiful that they named a replacement for structure programming with even driven programming and even driven architecture. So later on, this, this, this invention got a name uh, observer pattern, which is a uh, well-known pattern. But anyways, let's have a look how this pattern affected the development. Well, first of all, what I'd like to say is that before everything that we were doing was related to polling, right? Because engineer just, just had access to events queue and the engineer had to periodically check whether there is new events in this in this event queue and that's why we had this while true loop so we periodically checks whether there is something new in the in the event queue so that was kind of a problem we had to pull because there wasn't there was no push mechanism however with this new even driven api instead of polling we got push proper push api and with this invention everything just just improved significantly 
and this is not the same the same source code anymore so let me get back to pull UI again and let me set the sleeping time to 100 of miles to demonstrate that this is still luggish and let me switch to push so you can see smooth movement of the boxes so you may wonder what changed by fact you, we still or engineers were still using their normal procedures or functions however the main difference is that windows api at this point in time offered an option to pass these functions to the system so it's responsibility of the system to call those functions when there is new events and that was a challenge for hardware now to properly deliver and on time deliver those events which was solved pretty well so in this particular example box is nothing more than observable uh, uh, observable so something that is being observed in our particular case it's screen of our display the mouse move is event on which we want to react so we pass our observer which is a function simple function which accept event whenever it appears and of course whenever this function is being called we draw what we need well this example is in javascript for simplicity but this is a standard thing for building ui applications well looks like it solved the problem in GUI's approach and by fact at this point in time the problem was solved however there was a single problem since the ui started progressing and the graphical graphical things that we desire to 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 show on the screens started evolving and 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 the complexity of things started growing growing and growing well on the one hand GUI says well easy breezy i'll figure out how to build such such complex animation using of course observer pattern however the solution was a bit challenging and there was a couple of pitfalls well after some period of time when engineers show their code the source code looked like this well definitely it's it, it has some code but it's really strange code and it looks like a pyramid a pyramid of hell well, this is a common name of the problem which happens to observer pattern. And every engineer which looks like on, 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 on similar code base usually says, what the hell is going on there? And usually they're told that, okay, it's not a hell, it's, it's, it's code, my code, which does some work, but I forget what exactly it does. So. The problem of observer pattern that, 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 that appeared once we started building complex graphical transformation, complex graphical animations. Well, that was the problems of or challenges of that period of time to build beautiful graphic user interface. And it figured out that it's impossible to build in or build easily a complex, even driven animation, which reacts or depends on multiple things, time, user input, multiple objects, etc., etc. At the same time, it happened that it's really hard to, to do some complex uh, processing of events where you need to combine and compose multiple observers together. There was no single a uh, single simple solution for that. And even there is a paper uh, called The Deprecation of Observer Pattern appeared, well, 10, least, 10 years later, uh, which explains why observer pattern should be deprecated. And after all, uh, the problem was that nobody, nobody was able to read this code base after, or after it, is, it is developed once. So that was a set of problems. So engineers started, started thinking, what 
else should they do? And in 1997, Colonel Elliot and Paul Hodak, uh, again, Microsoft, well, I, I don't use Microsoft because, well, personally, I don't like Microsoft, especially of that period of time, so I'm using Mac even today. But all the innovations were coming from Microsoft, so we have to give them some credits for that. Anyways, in 1997, Colonel Elliot presented a white paper which got a name functional reactive animation. And that was the first time where the word reactive was used in the context of programming paradigm. paradigm. So what is what is this functional reactive animation? But in fact it's it's nothing more than a composition of a domain specific language, like specific set of operators uh, names, specific functions, and functional programming. And that was the core of innovation. So Connell Allen decided to use functional programming, which is well, well, well known for, for its good composability, where function is a first class citizen, and you can easily combine multiple functions, you can name functions, and then you can build a simple chain of functions like map, move, mouse motion on some specific object, apply to some other set of objects. And by just doing this simple set of or simple composition of functions, we are able to build this complex animation whereby mouse dragging, we can move multiple objects, delay them, etc etc so functional reactive programming or functional reactive animation started being a thing for building complex graphical transformation complex graphical animations and so forth and so on well to summarize what i said in general we've seen that observer pattern was a beginning of reactive programming well, we start with that part. And worth, worth mentioning that, that in general, observer pattern is a lazy pattern. So observable starts producing something usually when observer is propagated. And before that, nothing usually happens. And here is a nice example that, that reactive programming started its movement toward reactive system. Why? Because um, because reactive system is a system which continuously reacts and changes its behavior. So here in this example, observer pattern is the first step of evolution of reactive programming toward reactive system where observable starts producing when there is observer. Well, the second step was functional reactive animation as a way to, to improve observer pattern by usage of functional programming and a set of well-known functions which does well specific transformations like mapping filtering etc etc and that was kind of success however time was moving and we got to millennium so before that the main challenge for for engineers was how to build a user a nice responsive user interface so what happened and or what changed in, in 2000? Well, at the same period of time, another group of engineers was developing network. They were developing HTTP protocol, they were developing TCP protocol, and they were trying to build first distributed system. So they started in, back in, in the 90s as well, and they, it started to think closer to 2000. In 1995, as far as I remember, we got HTTP as a protocol for communication, for sending uh, HTML and all these well-known things. And later on, the communication between computers, remote and local computer, started being a thing. So the problem of this period of time appeared to be how to build how to build responsive 
and fast communication between local and remote computer. So you may wonder, okay, what problems we can we can spot here? It's easy, right? We are doing we are building distributed computers every day and distributed systems every day. So what challenges may happen there? Well, let's have a look at the following at the following emulation where we have an emulation of distributed system. So here on this picture, we have two remote computers. On the left side, let's just think that this is a client application, a UI which displays something. And on this UI, you can say, okay, I wanna find something on the, on the database side and I want to filter specific specific items, applying specific filter, and then display everything that is that is managed by by my filter. On the other hand, we have a database. And before two thousand, everything that we that user was seeing was on the local computer. And communication between between memory and uh, a, a, an application which was running in the same memory was the fastest, the fastest possible. Of course, it wasn't that fast as today, but it was to the best of that period of time. So the communication speed was just fastest. And well, since we were building applications which uses just procedures, which uses still kind of same approach, we always wanted to, to call function and get back something from this function. So in this particular uh, example, what engineers ended up with is just a simple application which call a function to get the next item from the database. And after that, this application, client-side application, tries to check whether this item fits to, to the query or not. And since before, before, before network, before distributed computer, everything was local, the communication speed was just, just really fast. And to find, let's say, 20 items, we had to spend, well, six or seven mil milliseconds or even less. So on the left top corner side, you can see the time that we spent for, for searching and filtering all of those elements, which is a good speed. But what changed once network appeared? First of all, appeared latency appear delay because now the communication between components started being over the network and the network of this period of time was really slow really really slow so simply saying we got latency and let's add this configuration into into our into our picture So before we got latency equal to zero, now we have, let's say, latency equal to one second. And now we see that every item which is being polled, which is being request over the same function, the same poll interface, spends around two seconds in both direction to be delivered. So first we send a request, give me next item, and then we get response after two seconds because this is an average communication time the road that we have to spend one way and the other well and we can wait long period of time we can even increase the velocity of the animation and we would require to to spend a couple of minutes still and that was a huge problem because everything that was developed back in time is not applicable to new challenges especially to this latency problem. So polling one by one is inefficient. What we can do? Well, if we need to, to request over the network every item, and we remember that taking items from local memory was really, really efficient, maybe we have to request everything, move it over the network, and put it on the client side, 
and then just apply filtering at once. Maybe that's going to be faster. Well, let's try. So, the engineers just say, okay, if we cannot efficiently communicate and take one by one anymore, let's take everything, put it in the memory, and filter locally. And, you know, that was really fast. Everything was just filtered at the same speed as it, as it was before. Well, even querying a batch is even faster sometimes because databases are optimized, optimized for batching query. So that was a huge win. But there was another problem. If you remember, the network of this period of time was really bad. It was just tremendously slow. And it had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of limitations. And one of them was, of course, network throughput or network bandwidths. Imagine that we are sending elements which fits into single pocket or a data set which fits into single network packet. So this data set can be delivered at once or by, by one, one delivery. But what if our data set is bigger than the size of a single network packet? Well, we have to split this data set into multiple pockets or a set of multiple packets, which has to be delivered, probably re-delivered because network stability was really low. So this can also delay the communication. Well, let's have a look. So let's put another another constant into our communication, which is network throughput. And of course, network throughput is definitely not infinite one. So let's let's set it as as twenty, just twenty elements. That's or twenty bytes. I don't know, just random random number. So let's see how communication gonna change with that. Well, we have to collect everything as it was before. But then, since we cannot send everything at once, we have to split our data set onto multiple independent pockets that has to be delivered in order. And the problem here is that in order to collect and start processing this data set, we have to wait until everything is gathered because we have a starting packet and we have the end packet, which usually shows that, okay, this is the beginning of my data set, this is the end. And for example, we cannot start processing this data set as, as for example, in JSON, in JSON array. We cannot start processing JSON array, array before it is, it is collected completely. So we have to wait until, until everything is delivered we collect it into a single buffer, into a single set of bytes, and then we try to ser deserialize this, uh, th those bytes into this, uh, into this array. Before we have everything, we cannot proceed. So we have to wait. And this also delays the communication on multiple seconds. So here we have almost three second delay. Well, which is still not bad. It's, it's still fast. But we have another problem, well, also related to hardware. If you remember, at this period of time, uh, Bill Gates was saying that 64 kilobytes of memory is enough for everyone. Well, this is just, just a funny word since we have today 64 gigs of memory, for example, on my, this, this particular laptop. But anyways, at this period of time, every engineer just got 64 kilobytes of RAM. And if data set is less than 64 kilobytes, then it's okay. But what if it's greater than 64 kilobytes? What's going to happen? Well, let's put this contents, constant into, into, our, um, into our query as well. And let's replace memory capacity to, let's say, 25 items. So we can fit only 25 items into memory. Just, again, random number. But this demonstrates that our system 
is limited by memory capacity and it's it cannot fit everything at once so if we get back to our demonstration and we will start receiving packets at some point in time we won't be able to store everything in memory and of course because of that our application gonna crash with well-known exception called out of memory and you know nothing changed even today 20 years later we still have this problem we tend to increase the amount of data that we send we tend to increase the amount that we of data that we want to store in memory and we still continuously th see this problem happens again again and again so nothing changed and we still aren't able to build reactive completely reactive system because if we are not reactive to uh, and take the memory capacity into into account then we fail so folks started thinking 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 and they figured out that okay if we cannot store everything in memory what if we request the amount of elements that we can fit we process them and then we request another portion of data we process it and then we request another portion of data well sounds like a good idea so engineers tried and basically the the, the thing that they created got a name pagination or batching well we all do in pagination today we don't want to display everything on on a single screen we don't want to store a ton of elements we request a small bunch of elements we store we process it and then we request another portion of data once the previous set was was processed so that's what we are doing every day so how it affected the communication after all well we started requesting 25 elements and then sending another request processing data send in another request if it's needed and so forth and so on so it, it it was kind of a hybrid thing between requesting one by one and requesting all so we are requesting portion we can process well relatively fast and then we request more and we cannot request in the middle since we don't know when we end up with with processing what we have right now so we 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 get an iterable a collection we process it and then after we processed it we request another because again this is this is a fashion with which we were developing our applications just using imperative programming structured programming and by operating with with normal data structures like arrays queues and so forth and so on so nothing asynchronous was there yet and in general, to summarize what we've seen, we can say that everything that we were done was, well, kind of efficient, but in general, we were still using polling mechanism. Initially, we were requesting one by one or polling one by one, and we understood that we can do better. And then we ended up that, again, by polling one by one or by polling everything, we are limited with, with network band bandwidths since we are requesting a ton of elements and this data set has to be split on multiple independent packets and we have to wait until all of those packets are delivered on the requester side and only after that the requester can proceed with the processing. Or we are limiting with, with uh, the, the hardware limitations like memory capacity and many other things. So we have to, to request by small portion of elements, but still request, request and request instead of reacting. So near that time, folks at Microsoft, especially uh, the cloud computation team, um, led by Eric Mayer, was trying to solve this problem because near that time, Microsoft started building their distributed system, their cloud. So they were thinking how to build efficient communication, which allows engineers to code well code 
or readable code and make application and communication between those applications and services high performant. So Eric Mayer was thinking, 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 and just remembered that the problem, similar problem that users or engineers had back in the time with UI can be applied here. Basically, what if we apply observer pattern and instead of requesting elements, we'll be listening to those elements. So the database, which is going to be applying searching on its side, which is going to be applying, I don't know, storing those elements in, on, on, on its side, on its memory, will just, just throw elements immediately onto network once we request it. And we will be listening to those independent async updates and we'll be reacting to them and process them as soon as they come. So Eric Mayer tried this pattern and it turned out that this pattern, which we know today as streaming, of course, is really efficient. So of course we have to request to send the first request, which is subscription. We say, hey, here, here I am, I am observer and I wanna request you a series of elements which you can send me as, a, as independent events whenever you find them on your site. So please do that in this fashion. And once this happened, the database basically started looking the elements, looking for elements and sending them as soon as the element is found. What it gives us? First of all, we don't have to wait until the whole data set is collected. That's what we've seen before, right? We were waiting until this set of elements is collected on one side, then it's transferred, and then we process it as a whole data set. With observer pattern, which is a function which reacts to every independent element, we don't have to wait for the whole data set to be, to be searched. We can, we can, find the first element and throw it to the network as one packet. Find another element and throw it to the pack to the network. Find another element and throw it to the net to the network. So the, 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 the latency between we start doing something on the client side and the first element is found is minimized because once the first element is found, it is sent. So the latency between we start and doing and processing the first element is minimized. We don't have to wait until the whole data set is collected. On the other hand, the problem with bandwidth is also solved because the lookup process is somewhat slow, right? And while one element is being delivered, we can uh, while we, we search for, for one, for another element in the database, the previous is already in fly. So once we found the next element, the previous one can be already delivered. Or the bandwidth can, can accept multiple packets, so they can be in fly. And the difference between we find next can be, can be significant, so the bandwidth will never go beyond the limit. On the other hand, once the element is processed, it can be technically thrown away because it's independent event, event, it's independent JSON. It's not the whole data set as it was before, right? Before we had to allocate the whole array of memory, the memory section for the whole data set. Now we have to allocate a small set in memory, a small portion of memory to quickly deserialize one event, process it, and then if it fits, we display it and throw away. If it doesn't fit, we just throw it away. So we don't have to store everything in memory as it was before. So the latency or the processing time overall is significantly decreased. The memory problem disappeared. And our application is doing what it should do. Well, that's a huge win. So that was just observer pattern applied by Eric Mayer. However, there was a couple of more challenges over there. So 
basically Eric Mayer applied observer pattern, which is really efficient in terms of in terms of delivery of data. However, observer pattern has a couple of problems. First of all, we don't know where is the end of our data stream. Well, it's a, it's unknown from the function perspective. We just pass a function which is observer, and this function is being observed, and we have no idea when when this function going to be stopped. We don't know how to unsubscribe. It's a problem. Again, just simple function. There is no there is no way to say, okay, I'm done. Don't send me any any other events, please. There is no such communication process. And finally, there is poor composability that we've seen back in a time as well. So a combining observer is leading to pyramid of hell, which is a huge problem. On the other hand, if you look from, from a different perspective of what we were doing, we were processing a collection. So we were iterating over a data set, right? The iterator pattern as a pattern has one problem. It's pull-based mechanism. We have inside iterator just two methods, has next and poll next, right? So we check whether there is next element, so we know where is the end if has next returns false, for example. And uh, we call next, but this next is poll-based mechanism, so it's disadvantage. We can unsubscribe with iterator pattern because iterator pattern has method dot close. So usually you can close your 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 processing whenever you don't need the data and you can deallocate your 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 memory from this data set. But on f f after all, iterator pattern is less composable because it's not designed for for kind of combining multiple stages and something and something simple and straightforward. So you have to write multiple for loops and you have to do uh, and you have to work with iterator pattern using just just imperative and structured programming, which is a problem. Again, poor composability. So Eric Mayer was thinking, thinking and was trying to solve kind of this problem with Observer because Observer looked really, really promising. And then he remembered that in 1997 by Connell Elliott in the same company this problem was solved and it was solved by functional reactive animation and basically the solution was application of functional programming so what Eric Mayer did basically was a combination of iterator pattern observer pattern and functional programming and by doing so, Eric Mayer got something well known as reactive extensions or Rx. So what is behind this idea? Basically, it's combination of two patterns, observer pattern, which is about push model and iterator pattern, which is about collection processing. By combination of those two things, we got observable, similar observable as we had before, which had one method subscribe. We got observer, which was similar to observer function. However, now this observer was capable to observe multiple events, multiple independent signals. For example, a next signal, which says, okay, this is your data item or data signal, as well as terminal signals like on complete, which says, okay, this is the end of your data set. And this is another push event, which notifies observer that there is no more data. So observer can deallocate everything that was allocated before. Or on error signal, which indicates that something went wrong on the, on the publisher side or on the observable side. So observer don't have to wait for any other events. Finally, we got subscription. Well, it's a communication breach between observable and observer. So observer can easily use subscription to indicate observable that it's not ready to consume more data or observable has to stop producing data. And this combination brought efficiency or performance. It brought 
understanding where is the end of your data stream and it gave ability for observer to unsubscribe and actually this is another small step toward reactive programming or reactive streams is reactive system because right now we have another communication stage another event to which observable can react so before it was able to react to subscription and start producing values now it also can react to unsubscription and stop producing events so our observable improved and started being a bit closer to reactive system to a system or to a component which continuously react to all the important changes here well finally as i mentioned reactive extension is not just observer and iterator it also the the huge usage of functional programming so we got everything that was in reactive animation almost same set of of operators and even more to to like even more um, the same functional composability so we start writing this beautiful code which is readable which is asynchronous and of course it is streaming code moreover this programming paradigm paradigm uh paradigm pa well paradigm um starting bad started being that popular so it was adopted not just in in dotnet it started from from dotnet from microsoft java um yes microsoft java this is this is funny thing anyways it started being adopted and ported to all other languages to javascript to java to swift and to all other popular languages so so it started being really really important to the community so we can say we are done we solved the problem of that period of time we created efficient communication by using observer pattern we improved observer pattern with iterator pattern and functional programming so we got reactive extension which solved the problem of efficient communication well the development of complex asynchronous systems high performance systems started being as simple as pi and it was basically the problem was solved and we've seen this so all done should we talk more reactive programming and reactive streams just 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 solution we were thinking however there was another but in this story so to understand the problem that appeared after after reactive streams started being and reactive extensions started being adopted was the next one so if we're gonna look at our constants we will see that the element processing time is 30 miles at the same time element lookup time is around 60 miles so it's almost 2x difference the processing time is twice faster than the lookup time what if our processing time is way slower than the lookup time let's have a look yay same problem appeared again so engineers that started be building real systems like netflix like microsoft and, and uh, twitter and many other companies that started adopting this streaming approach for building efficient high performance distributed system they started thinking seeing that their application is is crashing continuously because sometimes components that were were able to to process elements with with predictable speed started being slower and slower because you know this is distributed system and in distributed system nobody knows what's going to happen next it's just a chaos of of things happening around your services 
And if you're not preparing to failure, like slowing down of one component can lead to a full crash of the system, which is again, not a reactive system. So the problem that appeared was related to fast producer, slow consumer, which led to the crash of the system, basically fire in production. And that was a huge problem because reactive streams and reactive extension was push-based model. And the subscriber was not able to communicate the demand and the speed with which it consumes elements at the current moment. On the other hand, since reactive extensions was just a library, it wasn't a standard, another problem appeared that a single paradigm has multiple different implementations on standardized behaviors and so forth and so on. So by trying to use multiple different languages in, in, in a single, um, not languages, but di different libraries, different implementations of the same thing led to many, many compatibility problems. So that was a challenge, how to build resilient thing and compatible thing. So engineers from many companies like Microsoft, Netflix, Twitter, Lightband, or it was at that time uh, TypeSafe, gathered and started thinking how to solve this problem. They were thinking, 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 and they created after all the conversation, reactive streams specification. So what is that? Well, if we look back in the history again, we will see that the answer was there. And the answer was in batching. If you remember, once we started requesting everything, and we started seeing that uh, by requesting everything, the system fails, we figured out that we can request a portion, process this portion and request more. So that was a solution that basically engineers applied to reactive extensions. So they took this push-based model and combined it with pull-based model, but not in a simple way, in a synchronous way. So the push model is asynchronous, so the pull model should also be asynchronous. And we should be able to request and pull more data whenever we wish. And this combination gave us reactive streams specification. So a part of that specification is something standardized, something specific, which explains or specifies specific interfaces, specific behaviors, and so forth and so on. So that was a second thing that reactive stream specification was trying to, to solve as well. By introducing a set of standard interfaces, instead of just, just, just reactive extensions pattern. So basically it was unification and standardization of, of this pattern by spec and set of interfaces. So we got publisher with the same subscribe method. We got subscriber, but subscriber differs from observer by one extra method called unsubscribe. So this method was introduced to deliver nothing else than subscription, just a standardized way to deliver subscription. So there is no question how to properly propagate this subscription from publisher or from observable to observer. Now we have a specific method. It should be called before everything. And finally, we got subscription, which got the same cancel method. But in addition to that, it got request method, which is representation of this pull mechanism. So using request method, you can say, I want to pull X number of elements. So you can pass specific number of demanded events. And then your producer or publisher will push those events in a streaming fashion. So let's have a look whether this solution is reliable or not. So first of all, 
since we have 25 elements of memory capacity, we can demand immediately 25 elements. And then, as it was before, producer can start streaming them. And we can start slowly processing them one by one, slowly. Well, of course, because we have slow per, per, per consumer. But on the other hand, the mechanism that we got is completely different to the batching that we had before. First of all, because events are supposed to be delivered independently. So if they are de delivered independently, we are not bound to specific memory structure and we don't have to wait until the whole data set is processed. In addition to that, the mechanism that we got in Reactive Stream specification allows us to request different amount of elements. So even though we requested 25, we can change the size of the next prefetch, the next page, to be smaller. For example, 19 elements. Since we processed 19 elements, we can demand 19 more. So by the moment the previous request is end, we, get, we have another portion of elements already delivered. Perfect. On the other hand, this mechanism is as fast as it was before, even though now we are doing slightly more async prefetches, but this does not affect the performance of communication at all. Well, just have a look. We processed and we request more. We processed and we request more. Well, the communication speed decreased a bit, but we can tune this. We can change when we request more elements. We can request, for example, when we process the bigger portion or when we, por when we process the smaller portion. And we can tune that right now because request method is async1. And this request can be issued at any point in time. So, reactive streams started being a thing. We preserved the same reactive push model. We got async batching, so we got hybrid model. And that was a huge improvement for reactive extensions because now we did another step toward reactive system. So now our publisher started reacting to another event. So it started taking into consideration the demand of the subscriber. Perfect. Okay. And you know, Reactive Streams specification is something that we have today. The development of Reactive Streams specification started in 2013. It ended in 2015. And by this point in time, the libraries that started being developed on top of this specification are completely mature. So today we have Reactive Stream specification adopted in the various of languages, in .NET, in JS, in Java. Well, I don't have Swift, but Swift has also adoption of these specifications as well. And we have a ton of libraries. We have Echo Streams, we have Project Reactor, we have Rx Java, Rx JS implemented this specification. We have Project Reactor JS. We have Combine, which is which is a built-in framework into Swift SDK. So there is a ton of libraries for your choice. And this is just awesome. For us, for Java developers, it's even more. Reactive Stream specification was moved to the standard part of JDK. So starting from JDK 9, all those interfaces are just standardized. And this is just a sign that this the thing was, was really, really, really developed well. And this specification is just brilliant. Perfect. So we can summarize. Right now, we are in a perfect shape. We solved all the problems. We are capable to build resilient system. Well, because now we have everything to which we have to react and we have to take into or we have to take into consideration in order to make sure that our system is resilient. 
So our subscriber is not overwhelmed by our producer. The compatibility and stability started just great because we introduced this push-pull based API. So everything just amazing. We were thinking, however, there was another problem. And that problem was in us, in engineers. Because we are, as an engineer, don't like to solve the problem and we don't like to, to learn something complex. We, we like to, to try something simple and vanilla, right? Like new Vue.js framework or any other trendy framework. We don't want to spend more time on learning something that we tried before. So basically the problem was the following. Functional programming is simple when you just start using functional programming. So when you wanna combine map, take or filter, everything is okay. But once you start getting more and more into functional programming, you're gonna start using flat map and then you will start seeing flat map in the flat map and flat map in another flat map and another pipe derived from another pipe and combined multiple pipelines. And then you made a couple of shots in your leg and you started crying and asking why I started programming using reactive and functional. So basically functional programming is something complex. Reactive functional programming is not easier. It's just more complicated because you have a sync nature of your events, plus you have the complexity of functional programming. And that was a problem because engineers don't like to, 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 to learn something really complex related to math. So maybe imperative asked engineers, but hey, imperative programming is not good. And imperative programming kind of was that. So again, go back to imperative. We really want to get back to imperative, even though it was not that well. Well, at the parallel time or at the same time, concurrently to the development of reactive streams, we got development of another paradigm, which called or which is well known as async await paradigm, or basically imperative with asynchronous. So what is what is that? Basically, in imperative programming, in, to, in order to solve the problematic of, of observer pattern, engineers introduced two keywords, async and await. Async to indicate a synchronous function, a function which requires an observer. And in order to simplify the resolution of such functions, engineers introduced keyword await. So you can use imperative programming in order to, to kind of to adopt observer pattern. Well, and that was a nice idea, actually. So for example, if we want to make remote call, we don't have to, to, to mess with observer anymore. We have to just call await. And that pattern was that good that back in a time, one of the fans of reactive extensions asked the question, whether reactive extension gonna survive? And the answer was like, yes, sure. The reactive programming gonna survive. But there was a kind of but. Yes, we are developing observable and blah, blah, blah. But we created another nice replacement, which is using async await. So what is what was that? Basically, something that they developed got to name async streaming, which adopted um, iterator pattern and async await keywords. So how it works? Well, you can get this async enumerator and you can use imperative programming to iterate over a series or a stream of async events using await keyword. So whenever there is no events, you don't have to put observer, you just call await. And then 
you iterate until there is events. Once there is no events, you check this by has next. And if there is no events, you proceed further. If there is events but they are not yet there, you get back to awaiting and then continue continuously draining. So basically that was implementation of streaming over imperative and structured programming. And that was dangerous and really, really scary for fonts of reactive extensions because it looked like a killer feature. And that killer feature started, started spreading more and more across different languages. We got it in JS, in .NET, in Kotlin, and in many other languages, to be honest. And today we even have it in Java, or almost have it in Java, in, 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 in some kind of similar implementation. So for Java developers, and for me, the killer feature is coming probably starting since GDK 21 with the project called Loom. Because project called Loom implements virtual threads and async non-blocking communication via imperative, imperative programming. So basically similar, similar paradigm going to be implemented in Java. So does it mean that reactive programming and reactive streams are not needed since we have async await keywords or similar ideas which are going to eliminate the need of reactive streams? Well, do we have any future? To understand the answer, we have to look in the other area of innovations. For example, let's have a look at the Graal framework. So what is GraalVM? GraalVM, for those who have no idea what is that, it's a virtual machine which is capable to run different languages within the same environment. So it's, it's just Java, but really smart Java, Java virtual machine, which can run Java, which can run Python, which can, which can run JS, and even more. And now let's just think about it. You can run multiple different things within your Java virtual machine. And all the things, all those languages are completely different. One of them has reactive programming, one of them has async await, one of them has nothing. Well, and now you can combine all of them in a single environment. And you can even make them communicating across the language boundaries. So the good question, how you can combine a sync await, let's say in Python, with a think await in Kotlin or a sync await in JS or a Loom project in Java? Well, this is a good question. And it's even more, it's challenging question because all those languages has of course specification for a state machine for how this should be implemented. But it's different specification, different standards, and they require different interfaces to, to implement and to make alive this thing. For example, in JS, async await is just the syntax sugar over promise API. In Python, this is completely different thing. There is, there is a future, and this future has completely different API. In .NET, it's a task. In Java, it's completely different beast. In Kotlin, it's again, completely different beast. And now you can, you can make this async await function available on the other language. So how you can wait? Well, it's it's funny. So if you if you gonna look at the Graal um, VM specification, let me uh, quickly quickly find the 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 doc somewhere over there. Um, yes, JavaScript and Node. 
and you can you can look how you can use um how you can in, in like make this interoperability between let's say java and and in js uh somewhere over there you can find a funny example that in order to to make a wait keyword work in in java like imagine that you create a function and this function has to be awaited right so in, in this particular case, your Java application has to emulate promise. So you have to create this promise executor. You have to implement it. You have to have your then method implemented in your object. And only after that, you can return this object to JavaScript so the JavaScript can await on it. This is just, just terribly bad because you have to emulate in your language specific other language implementation. And now think that, okay, you implemented this for, for, for GS, but you have Python code running in the same virtual machine. And this Python code has to also communicate with your Java code. And your Java code now has to implement future interface. Well, the worst can happen if you're going to try to implement both of the things on the same object. Well, this is just pain because all those stuff is unstandardized completely. On the other hand, if we get back to reactive streams, we will remember that reactive streams is not just a thing. It's specification. It's a standard. And you know, all Java architects love standards. So if reactive stream specification is a standard, it means that it is a standard, same standard for JS implementation. It's same standard for Java implementation, for .NET, for Python, for all languages. It's same standard, same specification, same set of interface, same set of behaviors, same set of guarantees and even much more to that. Well, React Stream specification has a long list of rules. Well, uh, just, just, just saying in advance, this set of rules is applicable for all languages. So we have it, for example, for GVM, and we have it similar for Swift, for JS, for .NET. Well, again, just, 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 a usage of specific platform related uh, languages and nothing more than that. Same set of names, the same set of rules and so forth and so on, same standard. So if you have same standard here and same standard there, you can combine easily completely different languages with completely different libraries because they're completely compatible. Well, don't believe me? Let's have a look. Here I have a simple, simple JS code, which is talking to Java. Well, here I have my Java code. This is Project Reactor. This is Reactive Streams. And I'm using Truffle here and, and GraalVM here. So I'm using Reactor Core, which implements Reactive Stream specification. Here is Reactive Stream specification itself. And uh, here I'm creating like just a simple jar, which returns to methods, like do simple work and do work. And one of them returns hundreds of items. The other returns, I don't know, billion of items. And this library can be easily combined with this JS code. So I'm doing that already. Um, well, to be, to be certain where, yes, here I'm using demo application and in this demo application, I'm calling do simple work. And, uh, since like there is no well-known library, uh, for JavaScript implementing a uh, reactive stream specification yet, we had project reactor JS, but right now we don't have enough capacity to maintain this library. So if you want to uh, help us and maintain this, this JS implementation of Project Reactor, just let me know and I'll, I'll make an intro into, for the team 
and and say that hey we have a person that want to maintain this library uh, but anyways for now i'm using an adapter between between react streams to to rx rx js for simplicity but that's just details i'm still using back pressure here as well anyways let me run this app using Grail. For that purpose, I installed Grail. You can find a doc how to have your not 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 uh, Grail, not JS running Java and 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 JS. But here is this this file that you've seen. And now I'm running this app. And it should work just just in a second here we go we got specific number of events coming from project reactor we can see that flux range sending elements and those elements are printed in jazz well to make sure to 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 prove that this is this is just code let me just just change this so this is in GS world. Let me recompile this. Well, just in case it fails, it's okay. This is JavaScript. Okay, it, it didn't fail. This is also okay. Sometimes it fails. I don't know why, but it works because this is GS. Uh, anyways, let me rerun. Here we go. Hey, where is my message? I put a different message. Okay, let me edit the jazz directly. Oh, right, because uh, I, I ran Webpack, I have to call TCK, TypeScript compilation instead of. Okay, probably it was rebuilt. So let's have a quick look. Grail. Yes, this is from JS World. Perfect. So let me run my app again. Work. Well, it failed. Something went wrong. No. Anyways, it worked before. So it was almost successful demo. Something was changed and it failed unexpectedly and I don't know why, but that's okay. This is another version of TypeScript and, and this is JavaScript, it tend to fail. Um, probably, I don't know why, because maybe something in, in, in compilation has changed, but yeah, maybe let me use npx tck instead of that let me use just building uh, TypeScript compilator so the picture could be slightly different. Yes, it now. Whatever. Um, you've seen it work. So you've seen a successful demo of Grail Java talking to JS. Well, you may say it's cool. Your your JS code is talking to Java within within a single a single virtual machine, but how but how frequently we are doing such magic? Well, I know just a couple of companies like Twitter doing something similar, and there is a couple of others, but not many. Well, just just a few, right? So, what is the benefit of React streams? It's if it's still less relevant if we have a sync await. Well, let's chat about other thing. What about streaming over the network? What about your API representation on different languages, which consumes stream of events? Can you do that with async await? Well, you can, but how it is reflected on the protocol? This is a good question. It's hard to reflect it with just request response communication. 
However, there is a good news. There is our socket protocol, which is implementation of reactive streams over the network. Same reactive streams specification as a network protocol. Well, and I can try to show you this demo, but I'm afraid that after this compilation, everything going to fail once again. So let me uh, do a quick, a quick trial. Let me change. Well, where is that? Not here. There. I have another example, which is using the same demo application. But here I'm running our socket server. And on the other hand, I will be running in the browser or socket client. So I'll be talking over reactive streams over the network. And here I'm returning the same the work stream and subscribing to this. And now it should go through, not through the language boundaries, but also through the network boundaries. So let's try and pray that it, it will work. What is the name of the file? Let me go back and check. Okay, it's our socket. It's our socket. Growl index growl our socket. So let me use it instead of this. No. Dot gs. And let's hope that it's it will be running. Yes, it started. Perfect. So we have Node.js server or socket server running by Graal in JavaScript. And this JavaScript will be talking to Java code, which is going to be generating data. Magic. And now I'll be opening a browser on the local host 8085. Well, upgrade required. Why? And we'll be doing a bit of magic. Well, it, this demo can fail as well because the previous one failed. So I'm not sure um, that everything gonna work as expected. Uh, I'm afraid it's, it's not gonna work. Or uh, wait a sec, probably forget one, one thing. Yes, I forget to change this index R socket. I have a web page which is running our socket client. So here I had in our socket server a JS code hosted by Grail. So of course I have to have a JS client over there. So I have to enable it and I'm doing it through the previous the previous API. And here, here it is. It's our socket client. And this R socket client request stream, which returns a publisher. But this publisher represents a network publisher, a network stream. And here I'm exposing subscription so we can send demand. So we have the same protocol, the same reactive streams, but over the network. And here I'm exposing subscription so I can I can consume this subscription here inside JS console. So let's get back to there. And here you can see the terminal and here there is subscription my and here there is request method. So it can send request. And this request should be reflected in the console. Here we go. We got it. So we got request one, which is delivered to this Java application, to this Java code, propagated through this GS code here. So this event map to hello with number, and then delivered as event over there. So for example, if I demand 10, I will get 10 more. We can see request 10 in the console. 
and 10 more elements produce. And to end React to streams communication, not only through JS to Java inside one virtual machine, but also through the network. Well, this is this is amazing. React to streams specification and React to streams is not great just just because it's standard. It's great because it can be expanded through all the boundaries. Beautiful, I love it. So. Coming back to the question, is there any future of React to Streams protocol? And the answer, there is future. First of all, since this is a standard, and secondly, because our socket is another example of React to Streams as a network protocol, which can be expanded even further. This is beautiful. So, any future? The answer is yes, and at the same time, the answer is no, because it depends. And in order to understand whether Reactive Streams has any future in your particular production, you have to evaluate your production. And you have to think using a goose cube. Well, this is a joke. This is not a goose cube. This is uh, a cube developed by Eric Mayer, and you can find uh, the white paper where uh, he explains why um, specifically this cube explains your application. Uh, the paper is called Your Mouse is Your Database. Uh, but anyways, in the, inside this cube you have multiple important edges. So one of the edges is volume of your data. The other edge is velocity of per, or performance that you need to achieve or latency. And the second and the third uh, edge is variety, basically the variety of your database. So variety means k-value database, which is really flexible database, or private key, foreign key, or just, just standard relationship database. So if you need slow performance or you don't need to, to offer um, high throughput and, and, and low latency, you don't have enough data to transfer or much data to transfer. And you better stick to simple relationship database or basically private key, foreign key data, data store, just a normal one. Then probably you would like to choose async await as a programming paradigm because it's a simple it solves the majority of problems and it's pool pool based one so you don't have to learn functional programming you don't have to deal a lot with async streaming and with complex k value data stores on the other hand if you need high performance low latency and you have to deliver a ton of data then your choice is reactive extensions which is simple, straightforward streaming library. Finally, if you need this flexibility, if you need to, to balance between stability of the system and performance, Reactive Streams is the best choice. Because Reactive Streams is a hybrid streaming protocol, it's a hybrid standard. It offers a variety of different library implementations with same functional programming approach. And you can choose whether you want to request more data or you want to wait and request one by one. Well, even more, what is important is that Reactive Streams is compatible with all these async enumerable and async streaming approaches. You can still use streaming protocols like our socket but this streaming protocol and reactive streams consumption can be easily converted into async e-travel for example with kotlin or with javascript or with any other languages which support mixed approaches and a different set of 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 paradigms in a single language and that's going to be the best choice for you since Whenever you need to apply complex processing, complex combination of multiple data inputs, if you need to apply functional data processing, then you can use 
functional approach and reactive programming. But once you need to just, just simply iterate over the set of events and you don't, don't want to mess with complexity of functional programming, you can easily transform your stream of events, your publisher, into async enumerable. And a good example is combination of Kotlin and Java and Project React. So we are coming to the end. So let's summarize everything that we covered. Reactive streams got really long evolution time. It burned from UI and moved to enterprise world. It started, it, it began, become a standard, became a standard a specification in order to build reactive system. And we've seen it with, with reactive stream specification. And of course, standard is always standard. It's good in all its fashion, in all its, its, its um, appearance. So reactive streams is not just, just for, for implementing libraries, but also for doing network communication. And we've seen this through our socket protocol. Well, nevertheless, I recommend you to always evaluate your, your production, the system that you're building in order to understand whether you want to build with complexity of reactive streams. And that's going to be the best that you can do, do for your company and for your application. With that, thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you for being with me. Um, I'm welcoming you to follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm welcoming you to, to ping me at Twitter if you have any, any questions. Um, as far as I remember, the presentation can be found and the source code can be found behind this QR code. Um, all this, this goose um, graphics is basically taken from this Facebook fa page. So if you like uh, this goose, uh, just follow this Facebook page and like all the other images. And with that, thank you. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any of your questions.